Um, hello. Uh, can everybody uh, hear me? Okay, perfect. Okay, so uh, good morning to all the participants. Uh, sorry for that. So, uh, good morning to all the participants. Thank you for joining today. I am Liliana Ramirez Ortega. I'm going to be the moderator of this uh, webinar. Um, the, the topic for this morning, as you know, is how civil society organizations close the gap between transparency and accountability. Our guest uh, speaker today is Albert Van Siel um, from the International Budget Partnership, uh, uh, better known as the IBP. So before starting, I'm going to tell, I'm going to say a few reminders. Uh, remember to introduce yourself using the chat. Uh, please uh, tell us your name, organization, and country. Uh, also, taking into account that for technical reasons, all the microphones will be mute except the speaker's uh, microphone. So uh, don't worry about that. If you have any question, uh, suggestion, or comments, please write it down in the chat. And we will uh, pass all those comments and questions to Albert. Uh, also, please note that this web webinar is being recorded, so you will be able to watch it later. So, um, don't worry if you didn't catch something because you, you can see it later. You can watch it later. And also, remember, there will be a, a five-minute break after the presentation, so we can gather all the, the comments, questions, and suggestions and, and pass them to Albert. Uh, okay, now I'm going to say a few words about uh, our guest today, Albert Van Siel. As I mentioned, he works uh, for the IBP, International Budget Partnership, since 2005. Currently, he's the manager of research and learning at the IBP. He has consulted to finance ministries, NGOs, and legislators in uh, a diverse number of countries, including African countries and non-African countries. Uh, he established and managed the macroeconomic and budget offices in Western Cape government in South Africa. Uh, he, he's, he's working for the IBP in the office of uh, Cape Town. I, I forgot to mention that right now at the moment. Uh, and regarding his education, he holds an MA degree in politics, philosophy, and economy from the universities of Stellenbosch and Bordeaux, France. Uh, so Albert, thank you very much for agreeing to help us with this webinar. Thank you for all your work and contributions. Uh, we are very pleased to have you here. And I'm going to pass you the word, Albert. Thank you. Um, what I'm going to present today is based on, um, on 21 case studies that the IBP commissioned from independent researchers um, on what happens in country level uh, uh, budget ca campaigns. So these are campaigns um, for a, a number of service delivery issues. Sometimes there are budget transparency issues involved and so on. The, um, the, the challenge, that, um, the challenge that, that we face in a number of, of spaces is that the, um, when government budgets become more transparent, um, we, don't, we do not see a sufficient number of, um, of examples of accountability on the other side. So accountability meaning um, that government changes what it does. Um, so improvements in budget transparency uh, don't often enough seem to, to help in government changing what it does. Um, uh, there have been, uh, the, as the paper says, there are, there are a number of analyses in the literature about why this might not be happening. Um, 
uh, what this what my, what my paper argues is that in the in the in the literature, so in the stuff that people have written about this, that there's not enough analysis of the multiple roles that civil society plays um, in this in in the process of um, of holding government to account uh, via budget transparency. Um, the 21 case studies are available at that at the link in the presentation. Um, you can either write that down or, or else I understand that the slideshow is available. Um, and the paper itself um, is, is available at, at that link. Right. So um, if, if I say that, that there is not enough analysis of the role that civil society um, plays in holding governments to account for public spending, so for, for, for government finances, um, how do how does civil society do this? Uh, how does it play this role? Um, the paper argues that it does uh, that civil society does so in two ways. The first is by accessing, interpreting, and distributing information um, to multiple stakeholders. The second, so, so in a sense, this is a this is a job of um, of completing uh, budget transparency. So governments, as my examples just now will show, governments. Uh, do you uh, release some of the information, um, but not all the information and not all the necessary information? Um, even where the information is in the public domain, it needs interpretation, and very often that information doesn't get to the people that can hold government to account. Uh, the, the second, the second main channel through which civil society does this um, is by demanding accountability directly itself. So some of the examples I'll show just now will, will, will show how civil society. Uh, pushes government to change what it does and how, or how they do so themselves. The second part of this um, of this leg um, is also about how civil society puts pressure on other accountability players to hold governments to account. So how civil society, for example, um, uh, supports and pressurizes legislatures to hold the executive to account. So two main streams. Um, uh, through which civil society greases the accountability uh, machinery. Uh, first, through accessing, interpreting, and distributing information. Secondly, um, through uh, demanding accountability directly and indirectly, if you will. So directly itself and indirectly through others. Um, right. um, so I'm going to talk through, uh, through a couple of examples of, of each of these. Um, so it, it might at, at first at first glance it might sound a little strange to say that that civil society um, facilitates um, accountability by um, by accessing information. Well, we all know that that while gov while many governments some governments release some information, very often we find that the information that is necessary to hold government to account is more finely grained. So a government tells you, for example, what it is spending on primary schools. Well, very often the question that we want to ask, the, the, the issue that we want to hold government to account for, um, is how many secondary schools built and what progress has been made with the building of a specific secondary school. So very often the, 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 the aggregate level um, of budget information doesn't tell us those things. Um, and I somehow lost my slideshow again. Not sure uh, why. Back to slide one, five, four. Right. Um, so, um, so, so one of the jobs that civil, that civil society does to facilitate uh, transparency, I'm uh, sorry, to facilitate accountability at least, is to get access to this disaggregated information. So to get access to this inf micro level information that 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 citizen campaigns often uh, uh, need to focus to, to to find out what's going on with the specific issue that they're interested in. Um, so the, uh, the the example that I'd like to speak about briefly here is the um, is, is the, 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 the Asif case study. Renzo, uh, Renzo from Asif is on the is on the call. I saw a little earlier. Um, so in this in this example, um, Argentina has got a uh, got a reasonably high level of budget transparency. But what Asif wanted to do in particular was to find out how much progress is being made on the building um, of of um, school facilities. In poor neighborhoods in Buenos Aires. So you see, you see that we, we get to a level of, of um, tell there that 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 um, released budget information often doesn't. doesn't. Um, in in many examples, 
uh, civil, well, some of the examples are in civil society asks for this information, government might give it. Um, in many other cases, government resists. Um, and that's what happened in this, uh, this case of ASIF. What, what ended up happening is that ASIF went through a fairly lengthy process um, of using access to information um, uh, 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 legislation uh, to force the government um, of, of Buenos Aires, the city government of, um, of Buenos Aires, to release information about how much it is it budgeted and how much it's actually spent and how much it's actually delivered um, in, in school infrastructure. So in, the, in those ways, um, uh, uh, civil society will, will uh, liberate the information, as some say, that is necessary uh, to, to, to hold governments to account. But we all know that once we get this information, it's very often not so easy to use. So one of the, one of the first hurdles that, um, that too many governments uh, uh, tend to put citizens' parts uh, is that when they release information, they put it in the form of a PDF, uh, probably the singularly least useful uh, uh, file format known to humanity. Um, yet most of the most most I think most of the budget budget information that governments still release uh, uh, routinely is in the form of a PDF. Um, what civil society organisations then very painfully end up doing often is simply retyping. Um, in uh, at, at least in my day, retyping this information. I, I see these days that some of the smarter uh, tech people um, have a have a technique called data scraping, whereby they can get information from PDFs into formats like an Excel spreadsheet, where it's very easy, uh, where it's much easier to use that information and to find out what these massive amounts of information actually are. Um, that, that's a fairly, there's a, that's a fairly a mundane uh, example that, that many of us come, come across pretty regularly. Um, the, uh, the, uh, uh, a slightly more complex example is from the MUD schools case study in, in South Africa. Um, a group of schools um, and uh, uh, two civil society organizations, uh, the Legal Resources Center and the Public Sector Accountability Monitor, I think UKI, from the, from the PSAM is, is also on, the, on this phone call. Um, what their case hinged on was basic, was the idea that the government had allocated enough money, there was enough money available to replace inadequate school infrastructure. Sorry, I've got another school example here. Uh, I do have others, you'll see a bit later. Um, so the contention basically in a court case, so the, the, the LRC and the PSAM took the, the, the provincial government of the Eastern Cape to court um, and um, the contention was that enough resources was available and that the government had made a policy commitment to, to providing sufficient education infrastructure, but it, that it had failed to do so in practice. Now, in order to argue this case, um, the, the, the PSAM had to bring together two pieces of information that, that weren't together in the documentation. So information about what government had allocated, so what was in the budgets, and information about what government had actually spent. Um, in South Africa, in bu budget uh, information, you, um, people that have had the, the, the pleasure will know that the first category of information is typically on um, is, is budget documents that get tabled in the beginning of the financial year. The second category of information, so the information about government, what government actually spent, um, is released during the course of the year in um, in the in the form of, of in year in year reports. Now, in order to make that case, the PSIM um, had to have built up the expertise to find out where that information is, bring it together and to show that government had underspent. So while it could have addressed the issue, it didn't. So this is the second, this is the second way in which uh, civil society to accountability demands, and that is by bringing together the right types of information. So very rarely a single piece of information in government budgets is sufficient to do anything with. One needs to combine these pieces of information, actual, uh, actual spending um, and, and, and budgeted spending budgeted spending for this year and budgeted spending for next year. So one needs to bring together pieces of information that don't come, that aren't together in, the, in the, um, the documentation. One needs to bring them together in order to start making a, an accountability case. Um, the third, the third um, uh, way in which uh, CSOs make, uh, make uh, uh, information user-friendly um, is simply by fixing mistakes. 
So all of us that have, that have, that have ever worked with government budgets find out that once we start playing with the figures, very often, maybe a little surprisingly, um, there are mistakes in the data. So the mistakes of, 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 of addition, so things don't total up. Um, many of our case studies show um, show that civil society, after after getting um, information out of PDFs, um, after bringing together the right types of information, uh, did a significant job in just um, just fixing mistakes. So they say it's a dirty job, but somebody's got to do it. It'd be nice if government does it. Very often, civil society organisations end up doing it. Um, the, uh, the, the the fourth and last. Um, way in which civil society works with information to um, help claims, to, to help put pressure on government uh, ability is that it, um, it figures out who did what. So this is a bit like a detective story, um, and this is simply an analysis of, um, as the slide says, an analysis of where the blockages are in the public finance system. Um, so in the in the in the Samarthan case study, Samarthan is a, a civil society organisation based in India. Um, I think it's a little late for them, so there's nobody from uh, from Samarthan on the on the call today. Um, but what Samarthan did is it went and analysed um, everybody in government that played a role plays a role in delivering the, delivering the National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme in in, um, in Madhya Pradesh in the state in India, and it discovered that the reason why uh, why people weren't uh, being able to access the program was that officials at district level didn't have the skills to implement the program. So through its analysis of the data, Samarthan discovered that the, that, that f money was flowing all the way through the system. Somehow at village level, um, that, that, that money was not being spent. So once one has figured out government did what and who, uh, who in a sense is, is at fault, um, then obviously it's much easier to start holding specific people to account for, for doing right. So when one gets a huge amount of budget information, um, it's sometimes a bit hard to figure out um, just what to do with it. Once that information can be analysed to show where in the government system, where in the budget system, the the, the difficulties lie, then it's much easier to, to, to hold people in government to account. And this is the this is the fourth way in which civil society uses. Um, uh, works with budget information to enable um, a, 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 a demand for accountability and citizens to hold up. Yeah, sorry, I had one more. Um, one more. There's one more info, information job, which again seems a little it seems a little simple, um, but it is true that very often um, uh, the people in government just don't have access to the information. So people, or at least other oversight, oversight actors, just don't have access to the information that they need to hold governments to account. Um, so we see in the Fundar uh, Seguro Popular uh, uh, case study that um, that the health committee in Congress referred Fundar to um, to the public accounts committee, argue their case that states were underspending um, on health infrastructure, and that what was necessary was for improved reporting standards by states for how they spend government money. Um, so just that information that states were underspending and that the um, that there was um, that, that there were insufficient reporting standards for states was enough for the public accounts committee to uh, to, to pose and implement uh, new standards for how states report on health infrastructure. So. There again, all that Fundar did, Fundar didn't apply pressure to anybody. All that Fundar did there was to take that information to, a, to another oversight actor, the, the, the Public Accounts Committee and the legislature at this case. Um, and just that, that job of, of, of carrying information to the appropriate people um, was sufficient to get these new reporting standards out. Right, so all of that, everything I've been talking about is really just about the, the, the flow of information in the system. So my, my, my argument there is that um, it's, not, it's not sufficient for governments to release information for, for accountability to come about. 
we need these, we need civil society to, in a sense, be the bees. I mean, you know the story about how bees move pollen between plants uh, and so on. So, um, civil society of, of, of perhaps the information bees of the, of the accountability system. Um, society system of information, uh, putting it into the form that, that's necessary, uh, cleaning it up, um, and um, and then um, then to move it to the right place to, to make sure that the, that people that can put pressure on government um, actually actually get that information. Uh, civil society does more than that. Um, so uh, bees don't just move pollen; they also they also sting. Um, so I'm going to talk about three 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 ways in which um, in which civil society stings government into. into Spending money in, in a better ways. Um, so perhaps the um, perhaps the most obvious of these is where civil society puts pressure on government directly. Um, so um, our case studies have a number of examples of where civil society simply goes into the street, marches, um, and so forth uh, to to do a public dis display of power to put pressure on governments to um, appropriately. Um, uh, one of the other ways in which civil society does this is is through the media. Um, so um, while um, while it's sometimes a little hard to understand just just how and why a media holds a, a puts pressure on government, we, we know that it does. We know that most governments are still pretty sensitive to what what is reported on them. In, um, this is a this is a, 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 a Ways an almost an amusing example from the Hakeem case study. Um, I summarise it in the paper, but but please have a look at at, at Rosie McGee and and, uh, and Ruth Pilots's fa fantastic case study. All that Hakeem did is it took information from 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 audit reports to show that government had only built one percent of houses for teachers in in rural areas that it had promised. So. Um, the government had promised to build houses for teachers in, in deep rural areas um, of Tanzania. Auditor General reports that government had only built 1% um, of those houses. And Haki Elimu took that information, made a short uh, a television, uh, what they call a television spot, which is a two-minute short film, um, and aired it. Um, the, the, the reason this, become, this story becomes amusing is that the government uh, questioned uh, Akilimu on, on where it got the information. So many parliamentarians even suggested that that Akilimu had maliciously fabricated this information. Um, they then had the pleasure of pointing out to government that this was government that uh, this was information that came from the Auditor General, but it was also um, information that the government itself had given to the had given to the Auditor General. Um, so. Um, very quickly, government went very quiet about this, and obviously didn't want its um, its, uh, its, its shortcomings uh, publicised even further. Um, and in the budget that followed, government allocated a, a sufficient uh, a additional amount of money for for more of these teachers' houses. So civil society um, applying pr pressure to government directly. And the reason I'm calling it directly here is that this is not passing through a legislature. Um, or the, uh, any of the other formal accountability actors, this is simply um, simply pushing through the media, pushing through um, uh, through marches um, and so on, um, put pressure on government directly. Um, uh, I've got um, I've got three more slides. I'll be done in about five minutes' time, I think. Um, the second the second way in which civil society Contributes to, to pressure being put on government for, for budget accountability um, is by building the capacity of auditors in general uh, uh, legislatures. So anybody who's um, anybody who's done engaged in, in budget work at country level will know that very often you come across a legislature or an auditor, um, very often even um, even junior government officials that that simply don't know enough to do their jobs. So in in many examples, in the in the Limu case study, in a num in the Tika case study, in a number of other case studies, um, civil society reports that it it had trained the legislature on how to read the budget and how to interrogate the uh, the, the the executive 
um, on what it had done with public money. So obviously that is a that is a way in which we facilitate uh, accountability pressure on governments by simply helping formal oversight actors such as the legislature their jobs, to put it bluntly. Um, we, uh, we obviously um, aren't, aren't always that friendly, so very often civil society puts pressure on these oversight actors, their jobs. Um, so the UNESCO uh, case study um, in, um, in Brazil, um, this, is a, this is a regressive tax reform that a civil society co coalition tried to block. Um, uh, UNESCO work, worked extensively with the legislature to show um, the, the pernicious impacts um, that this le legislation would have um, on, um, on the, the delivery of, of social programs in Brazil. Um, and uh, uh, mem uh, members of Congress in Brazil very quickly understood what the electoral consequences would be for, um, if this, um, this law were passed, um, and they were seen to pass this law. Um, and in this way, in a number of, of very innovative um, other ways, um, UNESCO put pressure on the Congress um, to block this legislation. Um, in fact, the, um, the, the, the blocking was, um, was so successful um, that the executive eventually uh, from um, So civil society help formal accountability actors to do their jobs. And they do that by building the capacity, but sometimes also just applying a little bit of pressure um, on legislatures and, and others uh, to do what they're supposed to do. Um, there is a growing amount of evidence to show that civil society also does a, a, a interesting job at bringing other maybe informal um, oversight actors into the game. So we spoke, um, I spoke earlier about how our healing was used in the media. Um, the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the PSAM case study um, and a number, of other, a number of other case studies show that civil society is adept at bringing executive insiders um, into the accountability game. So bringing, uh, getting people um, inside of government, inside of the executive, pressure on their colleagues, the right thing. Um, the, the PSAM case study su suggests that, um, that one of the ways in which they had an influence was because the ruling political party understood that, um, that the, the support was dropping in the Eastern Cape province because of the negative publicity that, 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 that PSAM uh, yeah. um, A couple of our other case studies also show um, how civil society organizations carry information to donor bodies um, to governments to be okay. So summarize, what, what am I saying here? Um, I've been arguing that civil society organizations put assist in this process of put pressure on governments more accountable for public spending. Um, what, um, what is important to point out here is that, that the paper doesn't argue, and I'm not arguing that civil society is the magic bullet, that civil society can solve all the budget problems in the world. So as I say in the slide there, civil societies are not the only game in town. So as my examples showed, um, civil society is part of an accountability ecosystem. And some of the roles that civil society play is about making that ecosystem work better. So um, as the title of the, of the paper suggests, that they grease the wheels of this accountability. Um, so we need we need other strong actors in this accountability ecosystem for these things to happen. Civil society cannot do it on its own, um, and um, and the strength of these other actors will 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 obviously also impact on the effectiveness of society. So yes, context matters. Where you start in a given context matters. Um, but the the paper argues that what we need is um, is more research on how to deepen these relationships that civil society has to hold government to account. Understand more about this, uh, the, the relationships between civil society organizations and formal oversight actors, because the, these case studies show us that there's a fruitful partnership possible there under certain conditions that makes this accountability ecosystem. Um, similarly, as I've, as I've just said, um, 
to understand more about the relationship between civil society and other accountability actors. So when is it that, that civil society and the media work together fruitfully? But we've got examples of where, where this has worked. We also have examples of where, where it hasn't worked. So where civil society has, has, has lost access to, to the executive because of negative media coverage. We need to understand more about when that, when that works and, and, and how. Um, then an, a, 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 a growing number of examples talk about the, 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 the fruitful relationships that are possible between civil society organizations and executive insiders, so people inside the government. Um, again, we've got many examples of that happening. We don't have, a, have enough examples of um, when that happens. What are the conditions that must prevail? So in summary, the, 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 um, the, the, uh, the article says that there's this accountability ecosystem that, that plays an important role in holding government, governments to account. Um, civil society is an important role, is an important part of that accountability ecosystem, and we need to understand more about the relationships that that will make it possible for civil society organisations. Right, Liliana, back to you. Uh, yes, Albert, thank you very much. Uh, it's very interesting what uh, you were saying. Um, in the case of Mexico, for example, uh, in Fundar, we know we have more fiscal information. Um, we, as a civil society organization, are always fighting to increase fiscal, fiscal transparency. But then the question is, uh, now we have all this information, how we manage to, to, to use it to improve spending, uh, public spending, to reduce corruption, to affect public policies, to change public policies on behalf of the population. So it's really interesting to, to see and to listen here uh, what you were saying, uh, different types of uh, contributions of the civil society organizations. Uh, so we need to continue working uh, to demand more information and find uh, channels to use it. Uh, civil society organizations, we have an important role and, uh, uh, to help increase uh, the, a better use of the public resources. We need to continue ringing the bell when something looks weird or when we detect misappropriations of uh, the resources, public, public resources. And also we, we need to continue elaborating documents and papers like the one you are presenting us today. So, so we have more evidence of all the, the work of the civil society organizations. So, uh, organizations. so Albert, uh, it was a very interesting presentation. Thanks a lot. Um, so now we're going to take uh, a break, a five minute break, so we can gather all the questions and comments and pass them to Albert. And sorry again for all the difficulties, but it was a, a, a great presentation. Thanks. Uh, dear participants, we are back. <laughs> um, we have a lot of questions and comments, uh, so we are going to try to answer all of them, Albert, uh, till 10.40 a.m. The questions that could not be answered, um, we will make sure that you get your answer through email, by email, or using a, a thematic forum uh, on the platform. So don't worry, you, you, you will get your answer. Uh, so thank you very much because we have a lot of questions. Uh, or, uh, it was a very interesting topic. So Albert, I'm going to give you the word so you can uh, start with the answers. Hi, um, Liliana. So I'm just going to start from the top. So I've got a question from Heidi about um, about any examples of young people working to support social accountability. Um, Heidi, I understand that there are there's a there's a there's a fairly large literature on this, and I can I can refer you to a colleague of mine that that works on this specific focus area. But um, but this this crop of case studies didn't didn't focus on on the specific role of, of young people. Um, so I'm, I'm afraid I can't I can't give you a lot more on that. Um, Janet asked a question about what concept of of accountability I'm working with. Um, and she um, she says uh, usually accountability means that someone pays the consequence of their action, and not only that government changes the way things are done. Um, I've, I've worked with we worked with a fairly broad concept of um, of accountability for these case studies, and that broad concept um, of accountability was around the government doing something else, uh, doing doing things differently um, in order for the for the for the um, Campaign goal of, um, of of the civil society organisation to be reached. Um, so, in some cases, um, there the were examples of, um, of of bureaucrats um, having to um, 
having to pay the consequences of what they did. But it's you know we find that it's just really the the nature of um, of uh, the nature of politics is that very often um, in order in order for us to get what we want, um, there's some uh, there's some give and take as it were. Um, so I, I, I worry that a that a that a focusing on um, on, on on punishment as it were. Um, might um, might raise the stakes and might make it even harder for us to, to actually um, to reach the, the goals that we're after. So, um, and those goals, um, these case studies was about poor people benefiting from from government spending. Um, so it would be great if we could get both. It'd be great if bureaucrats could take the consequences of what they did, and and we could change things if uh, in, in, in in sorts of services that government governments deliver. Um, these cases, it looks as if civil society uh, opted for the second. So it said, okay, we are going to focus um, most exclusively uh, on improving the, the services that the poor receive from government. Um, okay, uh, Janet, I hope that that, that, that helps. Um, Julia asked about if there's not too much responsibility on civil society now. Um, absolutely. So the, the, the argument that I tried to make in the paper was um, – was that um, that what we what we need to build in order for governments to be um, accountable is this accountability ecosystem and this accountability ecosystem has civil society in it yes but it also has legislatures also has the media in some cases donors in some cases more informal actors like um, like executive insiders um, so in order for us to um, in in order for us to hold governments to account more systematically, we cannot just look at civil society. So I absolutely agree with you. Um, uh, we need to build we we need to build accountability ecosystems, not just uh, not just civil society because civil society ca cannot. And actually, in none of these in none of the 21 case studies, if you look through the lot of them, we don't have a single example of where civil society did this on its own. Almost always in partnership with someone else. So we need to, we need to look at the whole accountability ecosystem. Uh, Edward asks, um, what if some government authority cannot release information publicly concerning the public budget? Um, Edward, that's an interesting question. I, I, I get that question a lot. Um, it is amazing how creative uh, people will get to get access to this information. Um, so um, uh, it, is, it is very, it's almost always the case that, that one can get one can get access to some information. So the the, 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 the cases of where government is completely closed um, are, are pretty limited. Now, yes, it's true some countries have access to information legislation that makes it easier. Um, uh, uh, but people, people, citizens duck and dive. They find a way. They know someone in a ministry. Um, yeah, it's not. It's it's actually. Pretty rarely that this information is is obtained via via formal means. It's very often informal. So it is it is about um, it's it's about working with working with your networks and about working with the people that you know um, to get access to information. It isn't and it isn't always formal. Uh, via formal formal channels at least. Um, there's a there's a great story um, that that a couple of you know already from uh, from from Chad, probably one of the most closed um, environments where where one of our partners asked for information from the government. The official said, "I can't give it to you, um, but if you come to my house tonight, I will give it to you." Um, and this guy ended up just living a few uh, a few doors down from uh, from from the, from the civil society organisation guy in the CSO. Um, and he managed to get the information like that. So there's, there's always, there always seems to be some way to get at least some of the information. Uh, Renzo asks a really interesting question about the different roles that 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 um, see, well the the interaction between NGOs and grassroots organisations. Um, the reason I say that's really interesting is that we, we we are seeing more and more that if campaigns start with a specific issue, that they have greater impact. So that these that these civil society campaigns don't start as a transparency campaign, it starts as an issue-based campaign. So in the CIF case, obviously it was a structure. In other cases, it's it's access to employment creation programs or whatever. Um, and what seems to happen is that um, that these campaigns are a lot more targeted if they're issue-based. Um, 
So it, it almost seems as if the, if the relationship between NGOs um, and grassroots organizations is at its healthiest when it's led by, not led by, at least, um, at least the agenda is set by these grassroots organizations because the, the transparency asks are more specific, patient asks are more specific, um, and obviously they bring a means of applying pressure that civil society organizations often don't because they, they can bring numbers out into the street. Um, as Sylvia um, asks, uh, do you have do you, uh, the case studies, are there case studies that illustrate how CSOs have been able to use more user-friendly ways to communicate information? Um, uh, so yeah, yes, so there are there are a huge number of examples. So the the the, the archaic Ilimu case that I that I showed you, um, this organisation started making short films. Um, there are there are example the many examples of people using radio um, in East Africa where uh, where Aki Ilimu is from. Um, there's also a long tradition of um, of cartoons being used. So um, cartoons in government South Africa is also very strong on these cartoons. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, I mean, there's a huge, there's a huge number of, um, huge number of, of ways in which people um, make this, make this information more friendly. I think the point that I tried to make in the paper is that before that last step, so before that, before that cartoon, or before that um, uh, uh, short uh, television form or short community radio program, uh, civil society does a lot to get that information to that point the stuff I had about accessing information, um, fixing mistakes, bringing the relevant pieces of information together and all that stuff, which, which I think is often overlooked. So very often when governments do uh, prepare a citizen's budget or, um, or put, to put information into the media, it doesn't help citizens at all because that preparatory work hasn't, hasn't happened yet. So the, it, it looks like the, it almost there's a job of digesting this information. Um, which is a role that civil society tends to seems to play better than government does. Um, that needs that needs to happen before that last step, step of of getting something into a cartoon. Um, uh, Liliana asked um, if I can summarise the main contribution that civil society organisations make. Um, so how can we as CSOs continue to work to improve our work and to be more effective in acting as a check and balances of uh, check and balance on government actions. Um, I think that I think the second slide that I had is, is was was really my, my, my effort to summarize. So it's this it's this process of digesting information um, and the and, and the process of, of applying pressure to government ourselves and through others. Um, and I think the, the the I would say that the, the the key area that we need to work on to improve our work is um, is these relationships with other actors in the accountability system. So we we need to understand more about how we work with the media, how we work with legislatures, how we work with auditors. It seems it seems from these case studies that once we do that, once we um, once we strengthen those relationships, um, that's when we apply the most pressure to government. So I think that's the that's the that's the space here. So um, very often uh, I, I would stick my neck out and say most of the advocacy. Uh, training that, that civil society organisations do, uh, uh, or, or citizens and for themselves, almost acts as if civil society is on its own. Well, all 21 our case studies show that that's not the case. It's, it's most always effective civil society campaigns are about about the relationships with other account, with other um, with other uh, oversight actors. Um, so uh, just back to Renzo's question, we also see that um, that um, that it, it's the dense relationships between different civil society organisations, NGOs, grassroots, uh, trade unions, churches, and so on. When you get that, then um, then these campaigns are more are more most effective. Um, that was Liliana's question. Um, uh, Marine asked the question about if there are any studies of the accountability ecosystems, or if this is an emerging field. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not an academic, so I don't, I don't know everything that's, that's available out there. Um, I do think that this is, this is a pretty sparse field. I don't, I don't think there's enough. Of, of, um, I think the area that comes closest is some of the political economy analyses that, um, that have been done by, by the, the German Development Association, by DIFID a few years back. Um, 
uh, and uh, um, DFID in particular did a series called the Drivers of Change, where they looked at everybody, all the role players in the accountability ecosystem, and the power relationships between them uh, to see um, to, to see where the where the holes might be. But I definitely think this is um, this is a this is a, a, a slightly new field. Um, what what I think also needs to happen is that the people that build the capacity of civil society, um, so organisations like the IBP, like Revenue Watch, and others. Um, the organizations that build the capacity of legislatures, NDI, UNDP, those sorts of people, um, people that build the, the capacity of auditors, um, so InterSci and so forth, um, there's very seldom relationships between them. So that shows that the, that, that, that the lens that we're using to look at accountability isn't this ecosystem lens. So just the easy, the easy question is if you've got the best audited, uh, auditor in the world, but you've got a weak legislature and you've got no civil society to use the auditor's findings, all the capacity building work done with auditors is, is not going to amount to much, right? Um, in the same way, if you, if, you train, uh, if you train up civil society to, to have all the advocacy and analysis skills, um, if they cannot, if there isn't a media or um, a legislature or an auditor general or somebody that they can work with, um, the impact is going to be very limited. Um, and in every time somebody posts a question, my and this this, um, this list scrolls to the top, so I just find my place again. Um, okay, so Ali asked a question about. Um, establishing linkages. Um, oh yes, so his question was about um, about how one builds these relationships. Um, that's I mean that's hard, right? I mean that that's exactly the, those are the questions that I that I ended up with is that we need to understand more about how these relationships work. I think the one thing that I'll say that's really important is that um, that these relations. I'm not only talking about formal relationships. Um, so many civil society organisations, for example. Have, um, have signed memoranda of understanding with uh, with legislatures, right? Um, so that's not all I'm talking about. So, so many of these in many of these examples, these are ad hoc, short-term, um, informal partnerships. So, um, so uh, Ali, I would say that's only that's the only thing I can add here is that um, that we should probably use a slightly wider lens here and informal ways are that we can. Oversight actors. Uh, Esther asked a question about how to manage um, uh, complex context, uh, context with um, uh, uh, relationships with communities, government, other accountability actors, and so forth. Um, that's, I mean, that that is that that's the Esther. That is the um, that that seems to be the business of. Um, of these campaigns, so it seems to be managing all of that complexity seems to be the thing. Um, I think an, uh, I mean a very interesting way to, to, to unpack all of this, so to, to understand the complexity and to not get not get drowned in it, um, is the is the uh, the presentation that uh, Jonathan Fox did uh, a week or two ago um, on this platform um, around the the drivers of, of successful uh, social accountability work. Um, uh, and he argues that 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 it's about two sets of relationships: a, a vertical set of relationships, which which is aimed at making sure that all of the actors, that the, all of the all of the decisions and uh, actors actors in the policy process are monitored. So that if one monitors, for example, um, only the, the 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 formulation of a policy, but one doesn't also monitor the the formulation of a um, of a um, of the budget that goes with it, um, then we then then there's going to be there's going to be a hole in your advocacy strategy, right? So vertical integration. He also talks about horizontal integration, which is about coordinating the efforts of all the actors that try and put pressure on governments. So it, these all, all of the civil society, legislature relationships, and all the other stuff I've been I've been. Um, that was Esther. Esther asked for. Um, for a link to Jonathan's paper, I'm, I'm sure that Marine and Liliana can can help with that, um, Esther. But you have my you have my email, so you can ask me. Um, 
pop that offline if you, if you don't. Um, so June had a question about um, what if the government is not giving enough allocation for a certain sector? Is it still accountable? Um, um, the answer is no, uh, June. Um, so so um, um, it would depend, obviously, a bit on what the policy is for that for that sector. But yes, many of, many of these campaigns are about um, about uh, increasing the size, the size of allocations. In the, in the um, I think I'm kind of getting to the end here. Um, I think Esther had a follow-up question. Okay, Albert. So uh, thank you very much for for all the answers. Uh, so uh, before leaving, I just want to make some uh, announcements. Please remember that Albert's paper is posted on the platform. So if you want to analyze it further, uh, you, you you have it there. Uh, also, uh, dear participants, remember that we appreciate your feedback. So please take five minutes to tell us what you th you think you think, and uh, to fill this evaluation form that is in the in the link that you are seeing on the on the computer. Uh, this webinar, remember, has been recorded. So if you want to to watch it, you can do it in in the link here. Uh, please feel free to share it uh, with your colleagues and networks. And uh, another webinar is coming soon in May 2004. So we will give you more information uh, through the platform uh, as soon as we have it. And uh, please also remember that, uh, to sign up to our newsletter so we can receive uh, information of what we are doing in the platform and uh, new things. Uh, so, so also you can sign up there. So I think that will be all. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for thank you, Albert, a lot for your presentation and your time. And um, so it's 11:34 uh, in in Washington DC, Washington DC, and it's 10:37 uh, a.m. in Mexico. So uh, we were actually very punctual with the time. So uh, have a nice day, everyone, and we hope the information presented here was useful for your work and projects. Thank you.